show, I like fall funnily on my side. And every show I've landed and I felt fine, but it like scrapes a different layer of skin. So we have, I had four show, three shows this weekend, there's four shows next weekend. And it's not that bad, but it really does hurt. But I'm wondering how many layers of skin do I have left? Because I'm not gonna change it, it's funny. And also they get mad because I get blood on my tights. But then apparently you can take your own spit and use your own blood because if it's your spit, so then it gets off the tights. But then it was blood from yesterday. So I don't know what to do. <laughs> so stupid. I'm gonna shower. step on stage, this is your tool. And you have it all in you. Your body is carrying all this information that you've been working on for the past months. And all you need to do is step on that stage and open your mouth and sing your songs and your body will follow. As a dancer, you are meant to express your body. Um, your body is your instrument, so I'll even say as a dancer, you are meant to play your body. Um, to those who um, are watching the composition of what you are expressing or what you are playing is, I don't think it's a notion, in my opinion, it's not a notion of selling. I feel like on the path that I'm on at this school and the program that has built me up to this point, um, the type of dance that I do here at school hasn't been a selling point. It's concert dance, but it hasn't, it's mostly been in a way that is personal to my body. Um, um, I do believe that we definitely put our bodies to certain limits when we perform. Yes, I do believe our bodies are tools of expression and our tools for labor. Um, selling our bodies is a complicated term, but within a capitalistic system, it makes a lot of sense, right? The, I think the, the key question here is to what extent and what limits we have to this, and to what extent we have ownership on our bodies and we are not giving them away for the best um, bet. I think selling comes from a different connotation. And oddly, maybe selling has been taught to us to be considered um, a connotation that is more negative. So do you receive profit from how you express and play your body? Yes, but the notion of selling is almost like you are giving somebody something for their ownership. And so since that person doesn't necessarily own the body that um, that is being expressed or uh, played, if you will, then no, you are not selling your body. There's the words around, you should sell your performance, sell it, sell it to me. Um, and in some ways, what I am giving is what people are purchasing or what people are buying, but maybe not selling, maybe renting for a limited time only. <laughs> um, I don't know, I think that's a really difficult question to answer in terms of whether or not performance means to sell one's body. I feel like here at Muhlenberg, I'm not. But I feel like as a performer in general and knowing that I do want to go out into the industry, your body is part of that and auditioning your body is part of that and it's a hard concept to deal with because it's not only your talent and it's not only what you can bring to the table but it's how you look and it's how directors see you and if they don't like how you look and if they don't like you know your physique then you're not going to get cast and that is a big struggle so in class and when I'm at Muhlenberg and I'm working, I'm not selling myself because I'm truly my genuine self, 
but I know that when I go out into auditions, it's always in the back of my mind. It's, it, it's like, it's liberating to know that your body is your own and it doesn't have to be for anyone else's consumption, mm -hmm. um, even in performance, which does get tricky. Um, but once I got into like a liberal arts program, I think my idea of that did shift. And there are some industries of dance, like you know, like um, exotic dancers, all, all these different things that um, may be more catered towards that. But I think now about the individual doing the dance rather than the industry as a whole. I think as a performer of color, 100%, because that's not something that I can hide or erase about myself. And it's getting better now, societally, because directors are being more aware of race and who gets to be on stage and things like that. But there are still moments where I feel like I don't belong because of my race. I think so often, especially as like, a female identifying person and especially I do a lot of musical theater um, and there's a lot of visual interest there and musical theater directors are often old white men that are interested in young attractive women for reasons that are really fucked up but I have always felt like the look my look how I presented myself was just as important because of where I sit in the industry as my talent if not, sometimes more. There is a sense of humanity that kind of disappears when you are presenting your work, which in my opinion is really unfortunate. Um, however, you get it and you don't get it. I think it's just like, um, which, which is a trash statement that I'm probably about to say, is that that's just the way it is, but that doesn't mean it's okay. Um, so I feel like I will see even more now with the expanse of social media even being used as a PR tool that you are encouraged to uh, market yourself. I've even been encouraged at several points of like, why don't you have a website? Why don't you have this? And it, it, for me personally, it is very cringy. So yes, but dancers are heavily encouraged to market themselves. I think from when it was created, this idea of my body is my instrument and I have to keep it polished and neat and clean is so that p other people can like it. That fitness for a long time in theater and dance was about like how skinny you were, how muscular you were, um, and not necessarily like, can you, um, can I ask a performer to lift this repeatedly and they can do it regardless of body size or height. Um, and so I think for a long time, theater and dance has specifically been about selling your body and it's about selling yourself. Um, and not necessarily to the spectator, not necessarily to the audience, but selling yourself to a company, selling yourself to coaches, selling yourself to agents, um, dance companies, um, casting directors, that it all became about image for quite a long time. And I think that's still very true in a lot of places today. I think I do things for auditions and for headshots and for those sort of presentational things where I'm really selling myself that I would not do on a normal basis. I don't like wearing makeup. I don't like doing my hair super fancily. Um, I'm not someone who like minces my words or is like necessarily like, hello, how are you doing? Like all these niceties. But Again, especially as a female identifying person, I want to be very nice, very agreeable, polished, pretty, cute, but not hot, not too sexy. Um, I do so many things because I'm selling myself that I would never do if I was like at a desk job, but that's just a part of it. Because, I guess this goes for any industry, but performing is such a business thing and you can't not think about what your body looks like and especially because I understand that it's something that is very important to telling stories and things like that um I wish that it weren't so important and like I said society is getting better about it but being a specific identity is not something that I can change 
end. It's not something that I'm willing to give up, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not gonna sell myself short because of it. I'm Robin Watson. I am a lecturer of dance here at Muhlenberg College. I teach, I am teaching four courses this year. Dance Practices 1, Dance Practices 2, Tap 3, and Tap 4. I am a tap dancer by trade as well as an educator by trade, and those two together is what I do currently. My name is Lily Knowles. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior here at Muhlenberg, and I'm a dance major. I'm doing three concentrations, education, performance, and choreography. Uh, hello, my name is Dr. Leticia Robles Moreno. I'm assistant professor in the theater and dance department. I've been here since 2016 and I basically teach classes on performance, politics, critical race theory, and what can we do through theater and performance to make the world a better place. <laughs> Uh, my name is Nigel Samaj, my pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I am a director, choreographer, movement director, and educator. Hi, I'm Amelie Parchani. I'm a sophomore here at Muhlenberg. I'm a theater and dance double major, concentrations in education and choreography. Um, I'm very involved in choreography this semester. I'm choreographing Tick, Tick, Boom, um, the musical, and I'm also in Reset New Dances coming up in December, as well as In Motion in the spring. So I'm dancing a lot. <laughs> My name is Bethany. I'm a theater and business double major. I use she, they pronouns. And I identify as a singer and an actor. Hi, my name is Allison Mintz. I am a senior here at Muhlenberg College. I'm a theater media comm double major. I am, I would call myself a performer in that I act and I sing and I dance. Um, and I also have history with other things. And right now I'm in Three Penny Opera and I'm really excited about it. <laughs> we carry with us experiences, uh, histories, stories that are different depending on what kind of body you are inhabiting, right? Uh, and also our bodies tell a story even without us intending to tell the story. The moment that we enter a space, we carry within our bodies a story uh, that is linked to a history of colonization, racism, oppression, right? So, so far, I mean, at this point in history, uh, there is a lot of pressure put onto a black, brown, indigenous bodies. It's, um, it's a long history of marginalization, erasure, silencing, right? Um, so that adds up to the entirety of uh, extra labor that we have to do, right? Uh, and by the same token, it's, um, a, it's something to keep in mind when thinking, when I am part of a production as a brown, black, indigenous body, right? What stories I'm telling, uh, I want to tell through my body and what stories I am being place to to tell even against myself right so when a production is tokenizing one only uh, one person that is violence that is hurtful right uh in that and i know that we are very aware of that our students are pushing against that uh, on the other end when you have bodies diverse bodies coming on stage the story becomes as rich and as diverse as those bodies that are on the stage. And that is what the world is now, right? And that those are the stories that are uh, now telling us what kind of world we're living in. A specific example is for We Are Proud to Present that Muhlenberg just put on and it calls for white bodies and black bodies. And this makes sense for the story that it's telling. And it is of no fault of the director or anyone involved, 
but it was very obviously not a place for me. And it was disheartening. And I would have loved to have been part of that production because I love Nigel and I would have loved to work with them. But I understand that that was not my story to tell. My skin color artistic spaces are built for. My body type artistic spaces are not built for. I believe identity affects it because it will determine the outcome of how that dancer chooses to move. Uh, and again, because of the genre of work that I do, ch chooses to move and chooses to sound like. Um, but also, not only their identity, but also the identities that they connect with will either affirm or even condemn what they think uh, or how they think they should move. In the audition room, I see various identities affect auditions because it depends on the text that we're auditioning for. Um, I think when I, you know, very recently last year working on the adaptation of Romeo and Juliet, I think there were a lot of varying identities that were in this space that were possibly, that were like excited at the prospect that their identities were welcome in the space, but then were also in some way not scared, but were unsure of how their bodies fit in the space. So it felt like there was a lot of, I'm not sure, there was like a lot of teetering in the audition room and specifically in the callback space of like, is this right for me? Specific, specifically because Shakespeare is so white in a lot of spaces and so, um, and not necessarily made to be queer um, in a lot of spaces. And so saying that we're not doing that normal, that norm, I think there was a lot of uncertainty about like, well, how do I, how do I fit into this? Especially when it hasn't been taught that Shakespeare belongs to various identities um, versus if I'm auditioning for a piece that specifically in the text has written for black and brown folks or queer identifying people, like they feel a little bit more confident being in the space. A female dancer, you're expected to literally be a twig and that is not me and it never will be me. Um, that's something I struggle with a lot and um, recently I've been doing a lot of lifting, like lifting people in my rehearsals of the dance that I'm working on right now and that is something I'm not used to because I've never been taught to do it because there's this whole stereotype of like the guys lift and the girls are the ones that are the flyers. Um, yeah. I think this goes for like theater and film. I did a whole project about this in like a uh, female like driven eating disorders in film and television. The expectations, especially in musical theater, because there's 75 women to every one man, it seems, or 75 people identifying people to one male identifying. Um, so directors and creatives and people that are on the fate deciding side of things are a lot less picky um, when it comes to non, like, female presenting people. Um, I was at my Elon audition and I looked to my left and looked to my right and everyone was like a tall, thin, blonde girl wearing like a nice little blue leotard and I realized like, this, this probably isn't a place that wants me. Um, and I think that's tied to just being, it's just being such a concentrated market with so many female identifying performers and not a lot of men. Um, and also just men have been like, why can Adam Sandler look like that and then be in a movie with like the most beautiful woman you've ever seen? Sorry, Adam Sandler. I think men and women come into performance spaces being expected to be told a certain direction or a certain thing to do. Um, and recently what I've noticed, especially at Muhlenberg, those things are not the norm and people, we get surprised like, oh, you really want me to do this? You really want me to jump in the air? You really want me to lift this other person? Um, and I think that's a good thing like 
gender identity is such a wild ride. And when in performance, like, you are cast as a specific gender. And sometimes the costumes are, like, very specific and, and, and gender stereotyped on how you present yourself and how your gender is expressed. And I haven't felt this as much because I don't experience body dysmorphia, but I, I know performers who are genderqueer and they have so much dysphoria based on what roles they can get cast as, the costumes that they have to wear, the, the things that they have to do and say on stage, it's, it gets so tricky navigating. I think something that's really important to me in the space and in, in tackling various body types and various identities is that I know my body does things that other bodies can't necessarily do and vice versa, um, that their body's going to do things that mine can't do. And so I'm like, let's meet in the middle. I'm like, I'm going to do something for you, but... If you can't do that, or if your body is like, oh no, I can't, you know, there's there's some there's a limitation there, then let's figure out where our two um, bodies meet in the space and where do they like where can they work with each other. Um, I find that once I've had that conversation, various bodies and various bodies types and various identities seem to be a little bit more open in the room, um, but I've also seen spaces where bodies have been misused not um as whether that me, be me as an observer or as an assistant director or an assistant choreographer where it's an it's expected to be able to do anything that the director or the choreographer asks you to do and what's interesting in those spaces is that while the actor attempts it 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 it, it it's not full out and it's very tentative and um the, uh, one of our uh, community agreements for We Are Proud to Present was the body doesn't lie. And when your body gets really tentative and unsure of what to do, then we need to, let's have a conversation. There's clearly uncomfort there or um, some form of like unsafety that's happening. And so how do we address that in the moment? Um, and unfortunately, people, I think people who don't see that, um, are folks that are really rooted in this like idea that they are the director, they are the choreographer, whatever I tell you to do, you have to do. And not necessarily rooted in the, the collaboration of like, let's meet in the middle. Let's figure out what we can do rather than like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I think it's almost always like people, especially actors will be like, no, I can do it. I can like get down on my knees and do a flip. And people also lie about their abilities and then have to like, make up for it um dance pieces like when a choreographer is creating something you want to prove that you can do the fun tricks so she can put you in the dance and give you a feature part it's the selfish self-interest of theater and dance and like artists who perform that they want to be featured as much as possible so they're going to do the crazy thing that's going to get the director's attention and maybe get them to cast them again <laughs> um i think there is a desire to be a part of a space dare I even say like a FOMO moment. Um, and that fear of missing out takes a monopoly over their actual health. And that is something that has been carefully taught. So I think it's not just a student doing it, but they are learning that from some type of said system. I've been in spaces where there's a choreographer, a director that when there's someone, a dancer sitting out or a performer that's sitting out, that director or choreographer will not acknowledge them and not put them in a, a piece and have someone in, someone else fill their spot. Um, and I don't want that happening to me. I've been in spaces where a professor like will constantly nag and be like, you guys, you guys need to do better. Like you're, you're slacking, you're slacking, you're slacking, like do better. You're cheating it. Um, from the, like literally when I was in fifth grade, I remember I auditioned for the dance team in my middle school and I made it and they would have us do like this conditioning thing. And I remember 
literally being like I physically can't do this like I need to stop and just like people yelling at me being like you're slacking like why are you cheating it why are you cheating it and I ran into the car after we practice and I just cried to my mom and I was like I don't want to do this anymore why am I doing this this is not what I signed up for and that literally I was like what eight nine years old at that time and that's still I it's a memory I have and it sucks like to be told like you're cheating when I know I'm putting my 110% in every single time and it sucks to hear like you're slacking and you need to do better so I think that's where it comes from and even just that one little memory it's in the back of my mind so eight-year-old Amelie is saying no you need to keep going because you're gonna get kicked off the team um, and I know that everyone is so nice here and understanding but Somehow I'm just like, no, no, I need to keep going. Dance is very interesting because many times the notion of health is not uh, a factor. And that is actually not a good thing. Because I think about like how athletes get like sufficient like recovery and training and things of that nature. Dancers don't get that. Um, some dancers won't even tell you that they're not doing well to keep dancing. And that is not okay. Um, but I think there are some that are learning to advocate for themselves in reference of their health within the dance space. <laughs> yes, I mean, it doesn't, it shouldn't be killing you. It's not like that. It, so theater is also joy. I talked about joy. It's, it's about doing something that you love. And if that which you love is hurting you, we know that it's not okay, right? So um, I think there is a limit between uh, testing the potentialities of your body, which is always good. It's what athletes do. It's what uh, performers do. It's you you see how much you can give, right? There is a line when you start hurting yourself and worse, hurting yourself for the gain of others right or for the gain of the industry right and it is important also to think about again we're it's pandemic times right and um our bodies are attacked are under attack you know by politics by um a context that is a violent context right so we have learned that we have to take care of our bodies. We have learned that we have to take care of each other. Uh, we can test how much we can do, and we always are going to learn how much our body can give, right? Uh, but this uh, deterioration of the body, because of that pushing of the limits of those bodies, uh, shouldn't be part of uh, the way that we think about ourselves. Because in that case, if we are really uh, pushing our bodies to a limit of exhaustion and, and, and pain and hurt, that, that is a way of, quote unquote, selling our bodies. Because you are giving away that which is the most important and is yours, right? That is when you are saying, okay, take it. You get, it's yours. I don't care. I, I don't mind, right? Which is not, uh, not healthy at all especially this year and this semester of college I am so busy and involved in so many things and my health and my well-being has always been a priority for me but this semester it's been just going down and it's not the best right now um it's just hard because I want to do everything that I'm doing and I love everything I'm doing so much and it's addicting to do everything that I'm doing. Um, but I like I just recently got over a cold and I 100% believe that it was from stress and from being overwhelmed. Um, and because I'm doing so much, I'm staying up to the wee hours of the night doing homework. And because of that, I'm not getting enough sleep. And then because of that, I'm getting tired and I'm not able to push my body as much as I want to in classes 
and then I push myself in class, and then I push myself in rehearsal. And it's just an ongoing cycle. And I think this past week, my body told me to sh like to shut down and take a rest. And I saw that sign and I was like, okay, let me just take a step back and sit out this one. Um, it depends on how stressed I am. Um, in the beginning of the semester, I was being very good about sleeping. But now that I am more busy, it's more difficult to prioritize the amount of sleep that I'm getting. Um, I, for a lot of my life, would give up sleep in order to get assignments done and other work. But I think this semester I'm really focusing on my health because I know that that influences my body and how I'm feeling day to day and my mental health and all of that stuff. So, <laughs> I'm refusing to give up sleep in order to do assignments from now on. Yeah. Um, I would say I, I, I never prioritize health. What? I, pri I don't prioritize health, I prioritize how I look, um, which often comes at the at the cost of risking my health. You know, I've had a couple scares here and there, my friends get a little concerned. Um, like I passed down the voice lesson last year. Um, and there's also this, you know, attitude of like, just run your body into the ground. Um, so my health is never my priority. I haven't had any major injuries, but I've had this ongoing hip problem um, in my right hip. It's been since middle school. And when I'm doing a lot of heavy dancing, um, I it flares up and it's like I can't even do an arabesque and it hurts to do things. And I've had like moments of like crying because I'm not able to do the things that I want to do and I'm supposed to do. Um, and this, like, this whole hip issue, like, it comes up and it leaves and it comes back and normally my mindset is like, okay, let me try to push through for a few days and if it gets worse, I'll sit out and go see a doctor. Um, and one time I did have to go see a doctor for it and they basically just told me, don't dance. And that was like, no. I'm not just not dancing. Like, I have to dance. Like, what are you talking about? They were, because they were just saying, like, just don't dance. And that's just not an option for me. <laughs> so I did talk to my teachers at the time. And I was like, hey, like, I have this issue. And it probably won't. It's probably going to affect me um, and my ability to do certain things. But just so you know. And, of course, everyone is so like willing to give me the time to like rest and do what I need to do and I've had professors say like you can sit out and that's okay and I'm like no I'm gonna do this because I can't just sit there and watch people do these things that I want to do and want to get up so badly um so most of the time I do push through and then it normally gets to the point where it hurts really bad and I like literally can't walk so yeah <laughs> Yes. There's a lot of there's a lot of performers. I've I've worked with a lot of performers and I've worked with a handful of performers here who I think have tried to push themselves um not to challenge themselves but because out of fear that they wouldn't I wouldn't cast them again or that I wouldn't want to work with them again because they said that they couldn't do a certain thing and I'm like that's not true like actually like when I hit a roadblock or I hit someone who says like not hit someone but <laughs> when I when I come up against someone who's like oh I can't do that that actually opens up a more creative space for me because now I need to find a creative solution for that. Um, and most times what it does is it actually leads to that person getting some form of like spotlight. You know, if 12 people, if I've got a cast of 13 and 12 of them are able to do um, splits and one is like, I'm not quite in that level. I'm like, great, let's figure out how to make this around you and give you some form of spotlight so that they can feel empowered. Or um, rather than it's like, well, you can just do this. Then it feels like 
they aren't getting. I want it to feel intentional and not a spotlight on them that they don't know what they're doing. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of folks who will push past their comfort zones, not their comfort zones, who will push past forms of safety of their own bodies to make others happy out of fear of not being cast again, out of not being hired at all in an audition or callback space, um, or just out of fear of not being like, on good terms with another person um and that plays a lot and that goes into consent i think those conversations go into consent that it's you know when we start looking at consent not just about intimacy um and sensual and sexual acts that are on done on stage but as in general like i have power over your body so therefore i must ask for consent that staging and blocking um choreography all involve a level of consent and just because i consented to do this movement today doesn't mean that i'm consenting to do this movement continuously that yes especially dance like the way that i mean i've just more recently in the past couple of years gotten like really involved in dance the way that people be like, I have the nastiest bruise on my foot and I literally can't walk, but you know what I'm going to do? This 10 minute dance piece, this like kind of savior attitude of like, oh, I'm going to do it for the art. Um, and that goes for theater and everything too. Uh, or like, I'm really, really sick and I feel like I'm going to die, but I have to push through and do this audition. Um, like we're only allowed to have two absences in dance classes. I remember this girl came to ballet with strep throat, a danger to other people as well. But yeah, there's this mindset of like, because you're doing such a, I don't know, like a heart driven thing, you got to put your body second, because your instrument is your soul. There's a lot of like woo woo shit surrounding it too. Um, I actually, the first time I experienced this was in undergrad during a project of mine, um, one of my fraternity brothers, who wasn't an actor, but really liked to act, um, uh, auditioned for my advanced directing project, The Complete Works of William Shakespeare Abridged. And there was a moment where he was, was like running on stage and like slide on. And he was doing it well, at least from what I could see, for weeks. And then it got to opening night. He asked me if he could not do that slide because his leg was hurting. And I was like, oh, of course. Like, if that's that, that's fine. He's like, yeah, I'm just getting a bit of a bruise. And he like lifts up his shorts and shows me that there's this giant purple like bruise on his thigh and i'm like why he was like well i didn't want to ruin your vision i was like no but you're ruining your leg like there was a huge bruise and i'm like we can always find another way um especially in theater and especially in dance i mean if we can pretend that peter pan's flying like we can find solutions for things if they don't quote unquote work um but yeah i think Especially because, like, there are a lot of times where I feel very lucky to get opportunities, especially at a school like this where a lot of people are interested in performing. Um, it's kind of like you're in this spot. You have to you have to be grateful and you have to use all of your energy on this thing that it deserves because otherwise someone else could be taking your place. People would kill to be where you are. Um, and I think that kind of pushes myself and other people to go on autopilot I mean, there will be days where I realize, like, oh, I haven't put anything in my body and it's 11 p.m. Um, and that's not, like, usually even conscious, but it just happens. I notice that they are trying to figure out how they can express their bodies or be in their bodies well. I think, especially uh, their past experiences, they're still trying to navigate whether they want to hold on to those past experiences because maybe some students were in competition dance and those experiences don't teach you ownership of your body versus when you come into academia, there's this, hey, make a decision of how you choose to express that. And that is that takes time for them to actually figure that out and to navigate that and to be well with that. So I started dance um, at my local YMCA. So I, I did gymnastics. I got pushed too far in gymnastics and decided to stick with dance. And my, um, the person who ran dance at the YMCA opened her own studio. And so we kind of traveled with her and with her vision, it wasn't competition dance. Um, we did a couple of competitions in the time that I was at that studio. 
but it always felt really strange because it wasn't the key motive of my studio to do competition dance so when we went it felt like this world of like rich people who were always winning and we didn't have the resources to make competition dance so when we didn't win it felt like a loss more than a learning experience which is how my studio owner wanted it to be but it didn't feel that way at such like a young impressionable age when everyone is like at that age so exposed in like tiny costumes and provocative movement and we're watching being like this isn't what we do but is it supposed to be what we're doing mm -hmm. so it was kind of confusing yeah as an educator who actually choreographed for competition dance i do not like competition dance there's a space of uniformity that happens in competition dance that definitely compresses humanity of the of the student even in the sense if that certain student is doing a solo there are certain expectations sakes and and the expectations are for spectacle sake not for humanity sake or even for artistic sake of dance itself so um yeah i don't like dance competitions it's just unless the competition there are some competitions that actually have instructors that are teaching well but the notion of going into combat to get a ten dollar award and maybe a hundred dollar scholarship is weird to me and that gives now that gives off selling body right but also the amount of money that you invest to not only uh i guess get a prize for it but actually like these kids spend thousands of dollars just to enter to enter, not even win, not even win, but to enter. And I don't even think that's an investment because of the process is very pushed, is very rushed. Sometimes the conversations that the choreographers give are actually verbally abusive. And so I don't get, I just, I, my experience with competition dance was really horrific because there is there is a certain expectation. There's a checklist that they have and my aesthetic does not re meet that checklist at all. <laughs> I was the first person from that studio to study dance in college. So I got to college not knowing what to expect in terms of a dance education for me. And freshman year, I could tell who was a competition dancer just by watching. I mean, even in what was formerly DTP1, um, it was split into three levels. And I, and I looked at the highest level, I was in the middle. I looked at the highest level and a lot of them had competition dance tendencies. And I was like, is that what I'm supposed to strive for technique wise? And it's really interesting now being a senior, I've seen these previously competition dancers turn into a whole new dancer where all of those expectations, limitations have been like completely erased from what they prioritize now, which is really great. There's a struggle to find their humanity in their movement. And I'll even say as a tap dancer, there's sometimes a struggle for them to find humanity, not only in their movement, but also their sound. They're very stuck with like, this is how this is versus like, that is how it could be, but also you use your heart and your mind to figure out what else it can be. Yeah. When I was little, not so much gymnastics. Gymnastics, it, I didn't look in a mirror too much. Um, once dance started, mirrors were everywhere, literally everywhere. And I remember um, I got asked to be on like the the like older like studio team kind of at the YMCA, and they were all really like skinny girls and I was not like I was like a bigger kid um and that immediately made me feel less than especially having a constant mirror in front of me um I you know went through lots of like body changes throughout dance um and once high school hit I got an eating disorder just from from I think the like subconscious wanting to look like um, my my friends. Maybe a couple of years ago, I raised the question, who decided to put a mirror in a dance studio? Who, like, whose choice was that? And 
for moments i so for instance i teach in a space that doesn't technically have a mirror but i also teach in a space that does have a mirror but for the most part i don't um the mirror it again it depends on who's cultivating the space is the mirror meant for you to judge yourself or is it meant for you to see yourself um i used to be like forget mirrors mirrors are trash but recently i've been saying Use the mirror to see yourself, right? Not to look over to compare yourself to the next person, but actually to see, to see a reflection of yourself. And not and and hopefully that should be affirming versus condemning. Because a lot of times mirrors have a tendency of being condemning. Um, but again, the narrative around mirrors is I think what the issue is. Like if you're practicing and you feel like you're messing up, you look in the mirror to see the person next to you who you think has the strongest, I guess, technique to use it, right? versus or you use it to compare yourself to the other person and i think that's normally the space that happens in because then the comparison turns into judgment and now your judgment turns into shame versus like okay what do you see in the mirror and are you okay with that so is i think there's questions of like how does the mirror technically affirm versus judge and i think right now the mirror is still in the judging space i i mean i think this is such a like most girls. I, I don't know if anyone is truly like, you know what I love? My body. I look in the mirror and I say, I I mean there are a lot of people at at this point in our lives that like are comfortable in their own skin and have found like ease in what they look like and like really embrace themselves and I'm like very happy for those people. Um I grew up a very chubby kid. Um and was like obviously made fun of it for it because like everyone but I would say my relationship with my body is I wish it I wish no one had a body to be honest um I think it directly butts heads with what I love to do in ways that makes every single day of my life hard and my relationship with my body is also very expensive and time consuming and something that's literally always sitting in the back of my mind like I some of the best most fun times I have in college are often diluted by like the 10 second drift away and then I come back to I don't look how I want to look I need to change that it's been a big journey especially growing up as a dancer um because I grew up in a ballet studio where there were all these girls that were completely flat chested and flat and just not what I looked like. And you're in leotards and tights all the time. So you're in tight clothing and you're looking at yourself in the mirror. And from day one, I just remember like feeling so insecure about my body and being like, I don't look like anyone else. And <laughs> that was really, really hard. And like, we would have costume fittings and at my studio, so costume fittings and measurements. And I would always be freaking out about like, how much I was showing of myself or the measurements and were they, you know, bigger numbers than the other girls. And that was like a big thing. Um, and I guess now my relationship with my body is it's on and off. And I'm I look at myself as a beautiful body sometimes, and I, I have those moments where I feel confident, um, but it's really hard when you're getting dressed for a dance class and you have to put on leotard and tights, and you see literally just you and your skin and bones and you and the flesh. Um, and there's some days where I'm like, damn, I look good. <laughs> and I've been working out and I can see that and I'm proud of my progress. And then there's other days where I'm like, I hate how I look. I don't want to put on a leotard. I wish I could just wear a sweat and a baggy t-shirt to ballet. And like, I don't want anyone to look at me. So it really just depends on the day. And it also depends on if I'm feeling insecure because then if I'm feeling insecure I look at other people in my class and when I'm feeling confident I'm only focusing on myself so yeah that was a lot but I have never had a great relationship with my body um something you may not know is that at the very least East Asian the biological genetic makeup or whatever 
is technically different from Eurocentric and white Americans and also the rest of the world because something about our bone density or other I don't remember but a lot of Asians are very very tiny and I'm very very not so that's something that I've struggled with in my culture and being that kind of performer is like well when they're looking for Asians my body type is not the kind of Asian that they're looking for so it's another thing and my family has never been super good about making sure I have a good relationship with my body. Um, a lot of times the first question you get asked when you see a family member for a long time is, oh, um, have you been eating? Your body looks different. And one time my dad came home from a business trip for like two months and the first thing he said was, oh, you gained weight. And this is something that I'm used to, but it hits hard, especially when you're little and you grow up like that. And I've learned to be better and I'm establishing a better relationship with my body. I'm accepting where it's at and the fact that it's not going to change. So it is what it is and it's a long and hard journey, but we're getting there. Like I was, I mean, as a, as a chubby kid, I was in hairspray. Um, and the like producer, this woman, we were like doing a little photo shoot to like promote it. Um, and I was in costume and I thought I looked very cute. Um, and she came over and patted my stomach and she was like, is this part of the costume? And those kind of things where because you're on stage and you're a product then people inherently feel like they can judge you. Um, and obviously things have gotten, things have changed. Um, you know, we see more representation from different body types and sizes, but I think it's still seen as a novelty. Look, like this curvy actress can be Belle. Isn't that great? Being a female dancer is so difficult. And dancer who wants to be an ensembleist. Oh, yeah. Because I'm always put in the sexy roles. And I'm always put as someone who is like, okay, be sexy and like entertain the audience in that way. Mm -hmm. And I was in Chicago this summer. Oh, yes. And I loved it. And I had a great time. It was so much, like seriously, so much fun. Such a great opportunity. But I was always the one that they told to be sexy because I'm a dancer. And I was told to slide into a split and act seductive. And like, that's fine because that's the show. Yeah. But at times it made me uncomfortable. Like I was like, why am I doing this? And why am I like, like putting on a show with my body? And... It's so difficult because I was, when I was in the show and in the moment, I was having so much fun, but now reflecting on it, why did I like put on a costume that literally like exposed my boobs? I was wearing like almost like a thong bikini Ooh. bottom and like fishnets and like, sure, that's great. And that's the show, like I said, but something about it makes me uncomfortable. I don't know. Well, that's <laughs> like you were made to be objectified, and that was the role. And the fact that that role exists speaks to how society viewed women when that was written. Yeah, and it's a great show, and it's well known. Yeah, but also, yeah, I don't. Know. Yeah, it's just like, and I also feel like because dancers are known to have like to be flat chested and flat butt. It's when they see someone that doesn't have that and has like a little bit of tit and a little bit of ass, yeah. like you're, everyone's like, ooh, ooh a high like, commodity. Ooh, a hot commodity. Oh. And it's like, so you're saying when I audition for musicals, I'm only going out for those sexy roles because yep. I have a little bit of extra stuff mm -hmm. versus other dancers can be cast as men. Like I could never be cast as a boy in mm -hmm. newsies. Never. Never. I have too much for yeah. that. And I would love to be a Newsies. I would love to be a boy. But I can't. And yeah, that's, it's really frustrating. Yeah. To like, and also when I'm doing jazz, so I'm like ranting. No, you're when right. I'm, specifically when I'm doing jazz, I always go to the sexiness. 
because that's what you're taught is to be sexy and to be comfortable in your body yeah it's one thing to do it for yourself it's another thing to do it for an audience and in auditions you're always doing it for an audience mm -hmm. it's never really for yourself i've seen students who despise their costume and they will not dance well versus them understanding that it is a piece of clothing it is not a reflection of who you are as a person it is a representation actually of the choreographer not you um and that I have seen that determine whether the dancer chooses to dance well or to not. Um, however, again, society kind of sets up this whole um, shame within body imaging. And so if the costumes don't fall into a certain body aesthetic, that leads to um, embarrassment. I keep on saying shame a lot, but yeah, and shame. And that does, that can, that can, that can, that can determine the outcome of the student how the student chooses to perform so the goal is for the goal but also I think the set of what the costume is is not about the dancer it's about the dance itself and if dancers understood that I think the trajectory or even the choice of how to perform would just be dismissed it was just like okay I come out to dance even if I hate this costume right because the costume is actually not about you it's about the narrative of the dance. Yeah. Like, oh shit. Like, I think about myself and my body and how I, my body image, way more than I thought I did. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> because you're literally in a performance setting getting a light put on you, and all of these people are watching you, and they can literally see every single thing that you're doing at any given moment. And it's like, how do I. You know those performers who are like, I don't know what to do with my hands? Yes. It, it's like, you never think about what to do with your hands, except when you're performing. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what? you never think about how you look in a specific piece of clothing, except when you have the light put on you and the attention's drawn to it. Yeah. So it's like, fuck, what can I, how would I navigate that? And with the clothing, like, costuming mm -hmm. for performers is so tricky. Because as a performer, you're expected to listen and be like, okay, yeah, I'll put that on my body. Yeah. But, like, then you're like, shit, I don't feel comfortable in this. Why did I just say that willingly I could put this on my body? Yeah. But you have to because you're taught to be like, I have to listen to the costume designer. I have to listen to my director. Yeah. And I have to suck it up and do it. But, like, that shouldn't be okay. No. I... When I was working on Firebringer as a swing last semester, um, our costume designer, we, there was like a lot of faux fur, or actually, no, I think it was just like regular fur, like actual animal fur that the department had that they were like, hey, use this in Firebringer. And our costume designer was like, oh, okay. But they asked if anyone was uncomfortable wearing like animal products and that was something that I never had thought about previously, but I'm glad that they asked, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think back to what we both said is, like, here at Muhlenberg, they're creating a safe space. Yeah. And, like, people are being very inclusive and very much, like, is this okay? Are you okay wearing this? Yeah. Like that example. But in the professional world, that's not how it goes. Yeah. If you don't put on the costume they want you to put on, you're fired. And especially because it's a job. Yeah. It's like, if you don't do this or comply, you might not have rent the next month. You might not be able to eat for the next two weeks, or... It's like, ugh. I think professional actor, like, in terms of relationship with their, um, how being in an educational space versus a professional space, um, changes relation, performance relationships with their bodies. I think the key difference is that in professional world, I think, um professional performers or older performers, seasoned performers, have a bit more confidence in um, their work. And so they have a bit more understanding of what they are going to allow a person to ask for for their body. I think in educational spaces, we are, um, students are still learning how to communicate what they can and can't do with their body, so especially because they are younger 
and they can do a lot, and then in some ways they feel like they are invincible. Um, so I think they are still learning what is okay to say yes to and what is okay to say no to. Um, and so I think that's the key difference that, like, I would say professional actors are more keen to communicate their boundaries quickly and um, quicker than students are um, specifically like not specifically depending on the space um, I think students in academic settings are going to communicate their boundaries if they're given the opportunity to it's kind of like sharing pronouns that I found that unless someone says in educational spaces sometimes unless someone says or introduces themselves with their pronouns that the that the others won't do it until someone else does that we might go eight people in in a room of 20 who have not introduced themselves with their pronouns and then one person does and then the rest will but would the rest have continued if that one person hadn't stopped and so um versus i think in professional spaces i've seen people not introduce their pronouns but then also folks who will introduce their pronouns the same thing in terms of communicating their boundaries. Um, I know um, a performer, regardless of where she is working, she's like, all right, these are um, these are my name no-go spaces. What, how, how are you in terms of touching? Even if a scene doesn't necessarily require it. But she's like, we don't know what we're going to encounter in the work. Um, and I think the same thing applies in terms of students that are around consent, that unless we have a direct conversation around consent, that students sometimes aren't the first to speak up about it in space. And I think it just goes back into that fear of like, am I gonna get cast again? Am I gonna be able to work with this person again? Are they gonna, am I gonna be labeled as a problem? Um, which then goes back to the whole thing that I think that we need more training for <laughs> our faculty <laughs> and um, our directors and our choreographers who, um, who are gonna be in charge of students' bodies um, that they need to know and understand consent practices don't just apply to intimacy in the, in the, in the rehearsal room and audition room, but it actually just applies to like, I might be asking you to climb up on a chair and I'm like, I don't know. I don't feel safe climbing up on this chair. Is this the chair for the performance? Um, I don't feel comfortable climbing up on top of that one. Um, that that can be an okay conversation between myself and a director, other than a director saying, no, you have to get on that chair. And I'm like, cool, I'll stand on this chair, and then boom, it breaks, and now I'm hurt. Um, that's what it is. It's, or at least what I just, it just kicked on with me. Professional actors know that their body is their career and they are less willing to put their career on the line show to show than i think students are um, because i don't think students are necessarily thinking about their body as their career or as a tool in their career and so as an actor working professionally if someone asks that tells me i need to climb up on three blocks my first thought is, okay, where's the sturdiness? Where's the safety? As a professional actor versus as a young actor, as a student actor, I may not, that may not be my first thought because I'm just like, great, this is theater. I'm doing something exciting. I want to do this work because I'm not thinking that, oh, if this one block isn't placed correctly and I fall and I break my ankle, I'm not only out of this show, but I'm also out of the next show. Um, whereas in educational spaces, that just means that I have a semester to focus on classes. Professionally, that means I don't have work for three or four months. And that really, and not only do I not have work, now I still have to pay money <laughs> that I don't have to get the medical bills for this ankle. Um, so yeah. Well, outside the real world, it's more complicated because you have pays, <laughs> you have to pay bills, you have to, uh, you have to eat. If you have a family, you have to uh, take care of your family. Sometimes educational setting, because it's uh, smaller, uh, gives you opportunities to rehearse ways of being part of that real world, right? It's a rehearsal for the real world. Um, in that sense, I truly believe that higher education, educational settings, even in school as well, those are spaces for reimagining the world and also to be able to 
to create actions for world making to create literally to create a different world a different world right so in that sense um, it's it's very a collective work right it's true students realize okay so I can work I can really learn ways to do things on my own or with my people with my collective out there it is also how uh, professors, how staff, how the different members of our community are aware that this is, again, this is a rehearsal to be outside creating new ways of being in collectivity. I am someone who chooses my professors very carefully and I refuse to enter spaces that I don't think I would be comfortable with. So fortunately, my professors and faculty that I've worked with are very open and very communicative and handle things very well. Um, they are talking about race is something that they are usually really good at and even the white faculty can recognize their whiteness and how it affects the things that they can say and the things that they know. Um, also, Muhlenberg is just a great community, and it's a great space, and I'm glad that it's not super toxic. I think students are more empowered right now, and I love that. I think they're more aware that they have the right to be heard, they have the right to um, uh, to have a voice in selection processing and uh, audition calls and the ways that we do theater. I think in the past it was still very vertical, right? It was this is the season and you audition and you you're in or you're out, right? Right now it's more conversational, it's more inclusive. The the fact that little by little Myanmar is changing in terms of diversity, inclusion, equity, belonging. It's also a good um, a good way to see it. You know, so the context is changing, but it's also the attitude of the students is that they are more ready to to be part of the conversation, to fight for their own rights, and in doing so, they are also changing the way that we think and we do theater. There are only limited spaces in specific classes, so if there is a professor that is a little discriminatory in one area, I will make sure to tell that to people who belong to that identity. But I don't really care if a white person has a racist professor. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> um. How would you like to see these spaces improve? Oh, Muhlenberg is such a PWI. It'd be so great to have more opportunities for performers of color, more performers of color on campus, especially Asian identifying ones, because it has been very difficult for me to find that community. And even now as a first semester uh, sophomore, I know I'm friends with maybe three Asian people in the theater department, and it makes me sad, but this is the reality that we're living in. And I wish, I wish that diversity training was more required. Well, the industry starts in the dance studio space, and the question is, are dance studios affirming the body that is actually practicing the craft? And I don't think that is always happening. Um, but what I, I'll, you, the question was, what, how do I do that? Well, A, everybody, every human being that occupies the space that I'm, that I'm co-occupying them with. Um, the first thing that I was telling them that process is your standard in this space and that you are worthy of the space that you are taking up. And that's just not like a one thing or deal. That is them actually like hearing me say this on more than one occasion. Um, and I'll even dare say frequently to be like, you're worthy of the space you're taking up, especially in the midst of frustrations. It's just like, take up the space. In the midst of your frustrations as you're processing, take up the space fully. Um, but also that 
folks who have been called to cultivate these spaces need to understand the holistic part of the dancer, not just the technique part of the dancer or the tricks part of the dancer, but actually the holistic being, which is actually a human body making the decision to partake in a craft that you may happen to be an expert in, and you are actually investing in that human being who has a body, who is take, who is making the decision to take part of that craft. Um, I think the process, A, humanity has to always be affirmed in this space. If it's not, then you're not gonna have a great class, and you're not gonna be able to cultivate well, which means there'll be, a lack of vulnerability because dance is an immense mecca of, vu of vulnerability um, and you won't be able to see the student or the body or the human being let's even go there uh, reaches full potential and everybody's potential is not monolithic so yeah it, there's a sense of you have to affirm the identity in those spaces and you have to care well. Like wellness should be your main thing, right? It shouldn't be, oh, did you get the step? It's just like, how are you getting the step? Um, and then I think always, I don't plead. Sometimes I do. But asking, letting them know, and, and I guess it's more of the affirmation, affirming them that they are more than willing to ask questions, right? This isn't you do it, okay, bye. No, no, no. Ask a question if you're struggling. Please, I beg of you to ask. Yeah, that is how you cultivate spaces. Affirm their humanity. Tell them they are worthy of the space they are taking up because they are. If they are a body and they are moving, they are a dancing body. A dancing body does not have a size, it does not have a height, it does not have a pigmentation, it does not have a gender. If a body is moving and it chooses to move within the respective genre, that is a dancing body. I think check-ins are very important. A check-in with I think at the start of every rehearsal, there should be a check-in with the choreographer, whoever's leading the space, and the dancers that are involved. Um, I have been in spaces where that has done been done before, but it only happened for like the beginning of the process, and then after a few weeks, it kind of just dwindled, and we just went into our work. I think check-ins should be like mandatory um, because some people are afraid to go up to whoever's in charge and be like, hey, I'm not feeling my best. Can I sit out or can I just mark it today? Um, and with that check-in, as a choreographer and as someone who is leading these spaces, I want to be open with my actors and my dancers and say, I'm not feeling my best today. I'm having a cold, I'm tired, I'm stressed, this and that and whatever. So when I say that, my other people that are in my space can also feel comfortable to open up and say those things because I know from a dancer's perspective or a performer's perspective when the head of whatever's happening says like I'm not feeling my best or is honest with us then I feel able to be honest and feel able to be open. Um, so definitely check-ins and just like physical warm-up. I feel like, yes, I understand in rehearsal, we need to get stuff done, but like warming up your body is so important. Even if you danced earlier in the day, like every dance is different and every rehearsal is a different type of rehearsal. So I need to warm up my body for that specific rehearsal. Um, and I feel like a lot of the times choreographers or directors want to be like, okay, let's get going, let's go, let's start this. I like, let's just go. Um, and it's important to warm up and it's important to check in. Um, even if it just takes a five, five extra minutes, I'd rather have my performers uh, be healthy, be safe and not be injured than be injured and be a mess and fall apart. I actually think we've done a lot of work around empowering people to speak up. I think we actually haven't done the work in um, training folks who are leading people in terms of who have power, um, directors, choreographers, professors specifically. Um, I don't think we've done the work to get them on that same page because it's easier 
to talk to students and to talk to artists about empowerment and how to stand up for yourselves, it's harder to get people who otherwise may not listen to be in those rooms. And so I would say I think we actually need to do the work on training um, not the coming directors and choreographers, but directors and choreographers who've been doing it for a while, professors who've been doing it for a while, for um, doing theater and dance for a while, on how to address consent and address the power that they have over bodies and space. And it's difficult because, I mean, I don't know if you've ever <laughs> tried to talk to someone who has power and tell them that they have power. They tend to not believe it. They tend to not believe that there is this like power dynamic in the room that they enter. And so um, it can be very difficult to, to educate people on how to, to do better practices of um, how to approach various bodies in this space. Because um, it's not something that you can subconsciously do. It's not something that you can write on an audition notice um, or say in a community guideline. It's a thing that you actually need to practice on a day-to-day -day basis um, in your rehearsal room consistently and constantly. Something that a couple of people have talked to me about, not like professionals or anything, but people that I really admire in a way that like they have accepted their body is body neutrality. Um, in spaces, just like kind of making statements that don't have any like emotional like backing um, or seeing your body as just like a thing that helps you get through the day, kind of appreciating like all of the essential function that, uh, functions it does. Um, but in spaces of like injury and possibly putting yourself in harm, um, making it like ma very matter of fact, like this is something that because of this, I can't do this. And then just working with that because like the artists that you brought into the room are the people you want to use because of their minds and their like creativity, not just because of, you know, like the husk they live in. Um, and we gotta stop talking about people's bodies, like at all. It's, it's no one's business. And in a rehearsal or a performance space or a costume fitting, especially a costume fitting, um, we have to meet everyone where they're at and be sensitive to the fact that not everyone is comfortable in their body. Almost no one is. And at the age I am now, you know, I hope that I could like come back to this in 10 years and be like, oh my God, she's so insecure in herself. And like, you know, like, oh wow, like what a beautiful girl. But like, that doesn't seem likely. And I hope that people who continue to like grow up in theater that like you know start now won't have the won't have the same experiences that I did I think that navigating this campus is something that everyone handles differently and this campus is so small and it's its own little bubble and entering into the real world however you imagine that to be the industry at large is going to be very different because we all know each other. It is very difficult to not know someone in, at the very least, the theater department here at Muhlenberg. And I can hear things about professors and know not to take them, but I won't know those things about other directors in professional settings because I might not have those connections. So, I think that society needs to change in general, just to make it a safer place for everybody in any identity, and not just race. It's something that I talk about a lot because it's a, something that I'm forced to think about. But in any identity, it's, uh, things have got to change. Would you say you feel safe going into this industry? Sometimes. I recently had the opportunity to see Six on Broadway. And Anne Boleyn is played by Andrew Magaset, who's a Filipino woman. And when I saw her, I am not kidding you, I was crying. I was so happy to see someone who looked like me. But I, 
have also heard that there are stories of people who have not been safe belonging to specific identities. And I am hopeful, but apprehensive. We should never forget joy. We should never forget that we do this because we love to do this, right? And love is joyful. Love is not hurtful. So the moment that we wake up and say, oh, wow, this brings me joy, then that is a good sign. You are doing something that is good for you. The moment when joy is taken away from you, that's a red flag and something to think. It's like, no, this is not bringing me joy. So I have to pause and think, why am I doing this, right? Um, and I guess this is, is um, a way to think about our work as well as artists and creators. It's to transmit joy and love. Joy and love should be in our process, in our creative processes as well. What are the, how much stuff do we have to put up with just to do what we love? Yeah. Um, and for me, it's worth it. Yeah. I'm glad that I have these opportunities. Yeah. I'm, I don't know if it's worth it for me. Like, I mm -hmm. don't know. I think maybe for a little bit it will be worth it. Like, my mom was a performer. And she's a music teacher now, but she performed. She went on national tours, and she had a great career as a performer. But she told me this. She told me that it got to the point where it wasn't fun anymore, and it wasn't worth all the pain, and it wasn't worth the type of casting and the shit behind the scenes. And she did it originally for the love of performing, but it just came to the point where it was literally starving. And she didn't love it, and that's when she knew she needed to stop. And I'm scared for that yeah. moment. Because I don't want to give it up. Because I love it. Yeah. I'm scared to hit that wall of like, this is too much to put up with anymore. Especially because I am an Asian actor and I, I want to be able to show like the little Asian girls on the screen from like 10 year old me that this is possible that you can do this I would love to do that but I might not be able to I just got real heavy <laughs> real fast <laughs> Thank you. 